And welcome everyone to the GIS Basics Workshop. I'm Janet Reyes, the Geospatial Information Librarian here at UCR Library. And this is a refresh of a workshop I gave, gave about two and a half years ago. And it's designed for people who have maybe heard a little bit about GIS or geographic information systems and kind of want to know more about it before they dive in and learn more um, hands-on kind of things um, about it. So if that describes you, you're in the right place. And I think this workshop even has some things to offer for people who are a little bit more familiar with GIS. Um, I tried to think of what could trip you up if you didn't know about it. So that's kind of the framework I used for developing this workshop. Um, and it happens to be in November, and November happens to be the month where we observe GIS Day. Um, that is a thing that um, happens every year. This year it's November 15th, and uh, there are events all around the globe about GIS, um, celebrating what it does and how it helps our planet. So um, be on the lookout for those events. Uh, the UC, the University of California is having a three-day virtual event uh, for GIS Day, which we call UCGIS Week. So uh, pretty soon there'll be a link in the chat where you can go explore that. Anyway, a um, couple of housekeeping things. This meeting is being, this workshop is being recorded and uh, in about a week, the um, recording should be available on the library's YouTube channel. So you'd wanna check that out. And if you have registered for this workshop, a copy of the slides will be emailed to you. The slides have links that could be of value. So you do wanna take a look um, in your inbox for an email from me with the slides attached. Um, I have a helper today, her name is Daisy. She's gonna help uh, by posting things in the chat, uh, maybe uh, interrupt every once in a while if I'm not noticing things in the chat, um, questions I can answer, that kind of thing. So I appreciate her help here today. And lastly, toward the end, there'll be a link in the chat to go take a quick survey about this workshop. It only takes a couple minutes, honestly, and it's a great feedback for us to know if we're serving your needs or if there's other things we could be doing um, in the future for you. So with that, we'll go ahead and proceed. We'll proceed with the land acknowledgement. We'd like to respectfully acknowledge our responsibility to the original and current caretakers of this land, water, and air, the Cahuilla, Tongva, Luiseno, and Serrano peoples, and all of their ancestors and descendants, past, present, and future. Today, this meeting place is home to many indigenous peoples from all over the world, including UCR faculty students and staff, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to live and work on these homelands. So here's an overview of today's workshop. We'll start with some definitions. Then we'll think about what is GIS used for. We'll take a look at the types of data that are used in a GIS. We'll look at some of the software options that are out there. I'll spend a little bit of time on projections and coordinate systems, which is a very complex subject. I just want to give you a little feel for what it involves in case you run into an error message sometime that involves these things. Uh, at least gives you some context of what that's all about. And then um, toward the end, after that, we'll look at typical first steps for anybody who's using a GIS for the first time or setting up a project. Um, here's what you do. And then um, we'll end with resources, a slide with resources for learning more. So let's start with those definitions. There are many definitions out there. Um, I've picked two that kind of complement each other in a bit. Um, on the top of the screen, you see one from the Centers for Disease Control that GIS or geographic information systems are computer-based tools used to store, visualize, analyze, and interpret geographic data. On the bottom, kind of framed a different way and adding some different elements, uh, the four main ideas of geographic information systems are to create geographic data, manage it in a database, analyze and find patterns, and then display it on a map. So let's take a little closer look um, at those kind of things that you can do. And each one of those verbs like manage or analyze or create, that holds a whole host of things. So um, yeah, it's, it's a very complex system, but you 
don't necessarily have to learn how to do all of these things if you're going to use a GIS. And I am living proof of that. I only know how to do some things in a GIS. Um, and there's other people who take care of the other things and that's been just fine. So um, don't worry too much about needing to become an expert in all of these things. So we've talked about what is a GIS. Now let's talk about what is geographic information. Well, it can be associated with place names. So think of political units, anything down from a nation down to a municipality or natural features like mountains or rivers or islands. Also, there's administrative units that are used for all kinds of uh, purposes, such as a zip code, census tracts, things like school districts and service areas. Uh, those can be placed on a map as well. And you can get, aggregate information uh, with those areas and things. Um, street addresses work as well. Modern GISs, a lot of them are able to, uh, you can upload a spreadsheet that has a, addresses and it will be able to create points on the map. So that's a really cool thing. And um, coordinates. So coordinates like latitude and longitude, if you think about our globe, and then uh, some other types of coordinate systems you may have heard of are like UTM coordinates, or township range and section, which is something we use here in the Western United States. So any of those kind of things are considered geographic information. Okay, now let's talk about what is GIS used for. And this is what I call the thinking slide. So I'm going to ask you all to think about your own discipline or your own area of interest and uh, think about how you might answer some of these questions with that discipline or with that um, type of data that you're interested in. So I think we've all probably used a GIS in terms of location um, on our phones or our other devices. Uh, anytime we interact with a map online and we wanna know where are all the whatever it is, like where are all the Mexican restaurants? Um, where are all the bald eagle sightings in the last year? Anything like that a GIS can help answer. Uh, flipping that around a little bit, if we are in a particular place and we want to know what features are here, um, whatever they are, uh, a GIS can answer those kind of questions. Now we get into more complex thinking a little bit, of thinking about the pattern of something on the landscape. Well, how is that distributed? Is it totally even? Is it kind of randomly scattered? Is it in clumps? Does it gradually increase or decrease over our area of interest? And then going along with that, it's like, well, what else might be there that's making that pattern happen or affecting that pattern? So um, that applies to things in the natural sciences, the social sciences, medicine, whatever you can think of. Um, these are kind of questions that you can ask. Then going along with um, patterns and things, we have trends, which now we're introducing an element of time, right? So how has the presence or distribution of the thing we're interested in changed over time. It's like looking at a series of maps that were compiled at different um, time, time periods. And then kind of combining all of that together, we can think about the impacts of changes. So did the change in one thing affect the presence or distribution of this other thing that we're looking at on the map? Then we can think about forecasting as well. So what else might change and how much if this change occurs? And uh, we totally, see that kind of thing happening with say uh, climate models and we're predicting if the temperature goes up how would the you know shoreline change and things like that so anyway again this applies to many many different disciplines but these are the basic kind of questions a gis can help answer so then the next series of slides i've got them titled with three basic titles again about what a gis can do for you you can use it to view things, you can use it, view it, you can use it to create things, and you can use it to analyze. So let's start with viewing, which is again, I think something we've all probably done from time to time. You can use a GIS just to view maps or imagery, like on the left hand portion of the screen. Um, recently, capabilities have been developed where not only can you look at a map, but you can look at associated data that goes along with that map. So what we have here on the right-hand side is, uh, on the very right, this is a um, 
a heat map of homeless counts in a particular area. And then this is called a dashboard. So the dashboard features other types of information that go along with that map that's very useful to know. You can create maps. Uh, this is a very simple one that I myself created using Google Earth Pro. It's of the UCR campus, the two library buildings we have. I just created a path on how you get from one to the other. And uh, you can use a GIS to create something like this. A very simple, couple of destination points, uh, other kinds of features. Um, once you get the hang of it, you can create maps of your own. One thing that GIS has developed a lot in the last 15 or 20 years is the ability to work with 3D views of things. So um, for instance, on the left, this is a 3D rendering of a portion of the landscape of Mars that NASA is very interested in, right? Um, on, that's on the left side. On the right side, we have a kind of mock-up of a particular area where perhaps they're going to be adding those buildings that appear in brown. So they're just kind of showing people what that's going to look like. And that's a form of mapping. Visualizations. Um, it happens that these two examples I'm showing you are also in 3D. It, it's very handy, but visualizations can also be in just two dimensions. That, that works fine as well. On the left-hand side, uh, this is very interesting to me. It's a visualiz visualization of traffic accidents over time. So each of those little hexagon slices represent a unit of time. Maybe it's a month or something like that. And the color of each slice indicates whether there are more or fewer traffic accidents than the time period before. So the red is not a good sign. That means that there are more traffic accidents happening in, happening in that area. Uh, gray is like no change. And then toward the back on the upper left, you see some blue. And that would mean that traffic accident incidents were getting better or fewer. So a lot of information being conveyed in a very um, efficient way. I think it, that's a really great visualization. On the right, this one was used, uh, was made using Google Maps. You can see there's different heights of things and those heights correspond to um, visits to Starbucks in the greater Manhattan area. So very clear to see which one has the most visitors <laughs> per unit of time and which ones um, are, are less visited. So uh, very, very good way to get that point across. Now we're going to talk, I have several slides to talk about analysis in GIS because this is one of the things that is most powerful at doing. And I start with overlay because really this was the driving force for why GIS was invented in the first place. Um, back in the 1960s, people like foresters and other people who had to manage land, they knew they needed to look at how all these different factors influenced what was going on on the land and what maybe how they could model the best way to use the land. And instead of having clear plastic overlays on a map that they had to keep flipping and looking at in different combinations, they decided a computer system would do this really well, and it did. So in this example, this is the state of Pennsylvania, and they took all of the top layers, um, land use, animal loading, so forth and so on, to come up with what we see at the bottom, which is agricultural pollution potential. So this is one of the really key dynamic things that a GIS can do is combine different types of information and let people come up with um, models of um, information that's useful to them. Buffering is another great analysis tool in GIS. Um, this was a student project at UCLA a few years back. The pink uh, rectangle represents a possible sports arena and the possible location for it. And then what the student did was create buffers or a certain distance away from that feature and correlated it with noise levels. So in other words, by looking at this and looking at the parcels underneath and maybe having information about numbers of people on each parcel and so forth, you get a, a feel for the impact of how many people would be impacted by the noise on game day or whenever there was an event at that uh, location. Routing is probably something we've all used at one time or another on a GIS, but um, enterprises like businesses need to know this too. 
I believe this example is for a supermarket chain in the San Francisco area, and I believe this is the distribution center. And they have four trucks available, and they had to figure out what's the most efficient way to use our trucks and make sure that they can visit all of the, the stores in the chain. And the GIS can calculate that out and come up with an answer for them. Um, I like this slide because view sheds and watersheds are things that most people maybe have not heard about. Uh, this slide in particular illustrates what a view shed is. And the basic idea is if I am standing in this one location and I do a 360, I turn around and come back to the beginning, what are all parts of the landscape I can see and what are the parts that I cannot see? And this is useful for things like uh, military operations probably. And um, I've also heard of it being used on parade routes where they're trying to get uh, folks established on rooftops and things so that there's always eyes on the parade wherever it is. So that's a very um, interesting application of GIS. A watershed is slightly different. It involves thinking about when it rains and the drops of water fall on the landscape, which way is it going to roll? Is it gonna, it's gonna go down slope and come out this way if it lands over in this area. But just in the back here, it's probably going to roll a bit very different way and may feed into a different river system and things like that. So um, watersheds and viewsheds are two things, again, kind of using that 3D capability that uh, GIS can figure out. Back on that, that slide I call the thinking slide, we talked about um, patterns and associations. And we could look at a map and we could say, yeah, that looks like there's something special going on here. It isn't just totally random distribution. But of course, oftentimes we need to verify whether that's statistically significant or not. And most GGIS uh, software has those kind of tools that can enable uh, calculating spatial statistics and making sure that things really are significant and not just it looks that way. You know, we can we can be sure about that. And finally, this is my last analyze slide. Um, it shows that sometimes to get the answer that you want, you need to use different input layers and do different things to those input layers and maybe create a, an intermediate layer from the processes and feed that in with something else and do other things to get your final output. Uh, this, as you can see, the slide says, it's um, what was done to uh, model potential habitat for a bird species. So um, it's not always just, I do one thing to the, to the data I have and I'm done. It can be a whole string of things that you do to come up with your output. Let me just pause for a second and see if there's any questions or, or anything before I continue with what types of data there are in a GIS. Okay. Well, I figured it would be good to talk about the types of data. Um, this is something you're going to need to know. Um, we think about two basic types of data, um, spatial data, which is like what we see on the map. And then with one type of spatial data, which is called vector data, we also have tabular data associated with that. So let's dive into that a little bit more. So the spatial data, um, vector. Vector is probably the most used these days. We're thinking about points, lines, and polygons as if you were drafting it yourself, as if you were drawing on a piece of paper and creating um, points, which are like dots, lines, or polygons. Um, polygons are shapes or areas, right? So to create a point in a GIS, you would just position your mouse cursor in a particular location and left click, and that would create the point if you've got it set up that way. If you're going to create a line or a polygon boundary, what you would do is, again, position your cursor where you wanted it, click, and then any time you wanted the lines to change, um, not going straight anymore, but, you know, making a curve, you would also click, uh, left click to create a, a pivot point, as it were, so that the line could start bending. And uh, when you do that, those little, all those little increments where you've clicked uh, the that feature is called a vertex and the plural is vertices. So it's just to point that out, it's a little bit different from creating a point where you also, the action is just to left click your, your mouse cursor, but um, different purposes because 
you would map points because you had some interest in what they were. Uh, whereas this creating a vertex, it's just a pivot point for just where a line segment would pivot to a different direction. So um, also I want to mention that mapping points um, or mapping features as points, it kind of depends on how zoomed in you are. So for a map of the continental United States, if you are mapping cities like Chicago or Los Angeles, a point might work just fine. But if you're zoomed very far in, a point's not going to cut it. You're probably going to need to make a, a polygon because it's so big. And you might use points in that case for something like uh, fire hydrants or uh, street lamps or things like that. So your choice of what kind of feature and how you draw it depends a lot on how far zoomed in you are, or it's called the map scale. So that was vector data, points, lines, and polygons. Uh, the other type of spatial data is called raster. And I think we're all familiar with this because we think of it in terms of images and um, you know, TV screens and computer monitors and things like that. We are aware that it's really an array of uh, squares that are all the same size. And each little pixel, each little square has a value assigned to it. On the left, this is what's called a raster digital elevation model, or DEM. And this illustrates that within any little portion of this um, image or this display of elevation, there are all these little pixels and each one has its own individual value. So you get a lot more localized information with a raster than you do with vector information. Um, if this were a polygon in a vector, it might just be, you know, say like looking at the white here, it might just be um, these are, this area is all under 625 meters, you know, of elevation or something, but you don't know how it varies. But with the raster, you do get that information about variability. Um, on the right, we have a picture, an image of a portion of a landscape. And over here, the, um, the grid cells, the pixels, what they've done is kind of what's called image classification. So based on the values of those raster cells, of those pixels, they were able to classify the image into three categories. It looks like the blue is water, the red would be the man-made feature, and everything else would just be maybe natural land cover kind of thing. So that's another powerful thing you can do with rasters. So where do you get this spatial data. If you're going to use a GIS, where do you come up with these features, whether it's vector data or raster data? Well, if, if it's vector, you have the option of creating your own points, lines, and polygons by the method I described. You're moving your mouse around and clicking. Um, if you're after raster data, it's, you know, these days it's something you could acquire yourself. Uh, many people have drones and they mount a camera uh, facing straight down from the drone, or it could be another type of sensor like a thermal sensor or uh, measuring methane gas or something like that. Um, that all would be collected as raster data. But for the most of us, we are going to be using existing files of vector or raster data. Uh, there are websites called data repositories or portals, and if they involve mappy things, they have like geospatial in front of them or a geo portal. Um, and these are maintained by lots and lots of different types of entities. So government agencies everywhere from your local city to the national level has GIS data available. The United Nations and World Bank have uh, data on their website available for download. Nonprofit institutions, universities, and a company called Esri that we'll be talking about later uh, offers up a living, what they call the Living Atlas of the World, which has thousands of data sets that are available for downloading. And um, also, you can get data if it's available from, say, your coworkers or collaborators. And uh, I wanted to point out for vector files, when you're downloading, you could find one that is just like the outline of an area, say, California counties. And you might find a file that just has the shapes of the counties and which county is which. Or you can also find data to download that would include both the shapes and the basic ID, but then also all kinds of information or attribute data about, the, in that instance, counties. And so you'll, you can find not only things like counties, but 
there are places where you can download stream networks, um, all kinds of things, uh, and you'd have the option of adding your own data to that. So while we're talking about vector data mostly, I wanted to mention that the most common vector data file format is called a shape file. It includes both a geometry, the pictorial representation on the planet, and the attributes that go along with it, any information. So I think one thing that could trip us up is shape files are usually uh, in zip files, right? And so somebody sends, says, I'm gonna send you a shape file and you get the zip file. So naturally you wanna open up the zip file and find the shape file inside of it. And you might go, oh, well, this one has, an, has a uh, suffix that's SHP. That sounds like a shape file. So that's what I need. And just bring that one into your GIS. But actually that's not how it works. Um, you really do need all of these files, whatever it comes in that zip file, you're gonna need that to create uh, the layer in your GIS. So, um, and th there could be, they don't always have to be the same number of extra files in there. Um, it's It varies, but you just need to know that, that somebody gives you a shape file, take all the components uh, into your GIS, not just the one that has a .shp. So with vector data, there's also tabular data associated with it. Once it's loaded into the GIS, it's what we refer to as an attribute table. It contains characteristics of the map features. So in this example, this is the parking lots for um, UC Riverside. And every row in the attribute table corresponds to one of the features on the map. Every column has a different type of information about that feature. And you can have as many columns as you want. I like this example because you can see it, it could be textual information, it could be numbers, it could be anything really. Um, links to other things and stuff can be in your attribute table. So there's an ID number that associates each record in the table with each feature on the map. That's how they're linked together. And you can um, display or analyze data in any of the columns, in any combination. And you can also just pick certain features on the map to, to look at and analyze or display. So there's really all kinds of combinations that you can do. You're not just limited to, say, if you think of a printed map, what you see is what you get. Um, there's lots and lots of things you can do the way a GIS is set up. So where would you get this tabular data from? Uh, we talked about where you get the spatial data. Where would you get the tabular data from? Well, if you're creating your vector file, your vector layer, you can populate that attribute table as you're mapping along. Um, also, if you're in a project or something where people are out in the field and they have a particular app on their phone that allows them to collect information out in the field, uh, that can be something that populates your, your table. Uh, sometimes when people take surveys, if it's set up that way, it'll capture spatial information as well as the survey answers, and that will be part of the attribute table. Again, there are existing sources out there. We talked about how shape files can have attribute tables in them already. They mostly always do. But you can find things like a CSV or an Excel table that has geographic information in it, and that can be uploaded to a GIS. Um, a GPS file or database, any of these things can be the source of your attribute data. But I need to emphasize here at the bottom of the slide that you have to have at least one field or one column in your table that you're hoping to upload into a GIS. One field that has either coordinates or some kind of geographic identifier like a place name or an address, and that will link the records to a map or to the mapped features. So if you find, say, data that's perfect for your what you need to do and it's aggregated by census tract and you try to upload it into a GIS that doesn't have a census tract boundary layer in it, um, it the GIS is not gonna know what to do with that. So it needs to be something that they it can easily you know, link to. I see what this is about and I see what it, where it is on the map and uh, perform that, that link to get it to work right. Okay, um, 
I'll pause a little bit to see if there's any questions, and then we'll talk about some of the software options that are out there for you. Okay. So this is um, my conceptualization of the different types of software. There's probably other ways people would group it. I think of it in terms of three categories. The commercial software is created by companies. Um, they want you to pay them to, to have it. <laughs> so um, of course that's how they make their money. And we'll talk quite a bit about Esri, the, the first one here in just uh, this next several slides. There is also open source options, which means it's free to download. You just go to their website, download it, and you can use it. Um, quite a, a few open source options there as well. And then I have my sloppy bucket, which is other. Um, I've included Google Earth in there because obviously Google is a company. We all know that. But um, to use their GIS software, Google Earth, you don't have to pay anything. It's just freely available. So there, there's that. And then there are other uh, companies that provide GIS that has some features and some capabilities up to a point. But if you really want to do more high-powered things, that's when you have to start paying them for it, right? Mapbox is an example of that. And uh, I also included R, the programming language, um, in here. It's not a GIS, but people use R all the time to do many of the same things a geographic information system can do, such as analyzing data and representing it um, on, in a map. So I just wanted to throw that in there. Um, that, that kind of thing is another option that's out there. So let's talk about Esri for a little bit. Um, we need to talk about them because they are the market leader. I think they have the biggest share of the pie of anybody else. They are, they're, they were based in and still their headquarters is in Redlands, California, which is just 15 miles northeast of UCR. And actually UCR played a very important role in the formation in the early days of ES, it, then it was known as ESRI, Environmental Systems Research Institute was what it was called. Um, the owner used the UCR mainframe in the middle of the night to produce some of his very first products for his clients because he didn't have a mainframe of his own. So he came and borrowed um, UCRs when nobody else was using it. And also some of the very first employees of ESRI were UCR graduate students. So goes back a long way. This is now a multi-billion dollar company all over the world but it just started just a few miles up the road in Redlands. And this is a screenshot from their landing page for all the products they have. You can see it's quite extensive. I know the print is very small, but you can probably tell that almost all their products start with the, the phrase ArcGIS. That's your clue that it's an Esri product. Um, and this changes all the time. I go back and visit this every so often, maybe twice a year, and they've shuffled things around. They've added new products, taken away a few. So it's quite dynamic. They're always always working, always trying to come up with extra things. And I'm just going to highlight two of the most common products that they have. ArcGIS Pro is what you would use on your desktop. You would install it. Um, it's free for UCR affiliates, but if you're out there in the real world, you'd have to, to pay for it. Um, it runs on Windows. It does not run natively on a Mac. There are some workarounds, but they don't work very well, to be honest. So that's kind of one thing to keep in mind. Um, if you're going to use ArcGIS Pro, it also requires a lot of um, memory and things like that in your computer. So old, clunky computers don't run it very well, to put it one way. <laughs> But it has lots and lots of capabilities. As you can see from this screenshot, again, we have a 3D view of a map, which was not super common all that long ago, but now they have these capabilities. You can do many, many things. Uh, it's very powerful. On the other hand, there's ArcGIS Online, which as the name indicates, is available on the cloud. So it doesn't matter what kind of computer you have, you can use ArcGIS Online. Um, 
it's more lightweight. So Esri often suggests that people who are starting out learning GIS start with ArcGIS Online because it doesn't have quite so many things, but it does a lot of the basic things very, very well. So that's something to be aware of. Um, and just so you know, um, on November 21st, I am going to be offering an introduction to ArcGIS Online workshop. So we will be getting more in depth into what this offers and what you can do with it. So there are other companies, like I said, that offer GIS software. And the one I was most familiar with um, when I first came on the scene a few years ago um, was Carto. It used to cater quite a bit to the education community. They have since changed their business model. They look like they're totally, almost totally dedicated to helping businesses now, serving businesses. But um, Carto is another software that you may hear of. And they've always been really known for their uh, graphics, uh, outstanding graphics, they're just really striking maps, very visually pleasing. Um, QGIS, is now we're in the open source bucket. Um, QGIS is something you can just go to their website and download. It runs on a Mac or on Windows just fine. So that's a, one advantage it has over the um, ArcGIS products. Um, it doesn't have all the things that ArcGIS Pro has, but it has a good, very good share and they're developing it all the time. Um, so it's something to consider if you would like to use a GIS without having that barrier of uh, needing, you know, something going through a company um, to use. When you download QGIS, at least this has been my experience, um, Grass GIS comes along with it. Uh, Grass stands for Geographic Resources Analysis Support System. And um, the origin story of this is, is a little bit interesting. It was created initially in the Army Corps of Engineers. They were using it for their internal purposes. My understanding is they had some vendors who saw this GIS and they said, this is great. Would you allow other people to use it? So they, they did. They kind of released the, um, the code and everything. So that's what Grass GIS is. It's known especially for its ability to deal with raster data, all those pixels and things. That that's where it really shines. And finally, we have Google Earth Pro. Um, this is a desktop application. It can do some things very well that the other GIS software does not perhaps do quite as well, but it has some limitations. So it's, it's a mixed bag. You should also know that there is Google Earth for web that came out a few years ago. Um, again, it's a little bit more lightweight than the desktop application, but you can do a fair amount of things with it. So that's something that you might want to play around with as well. Okay. So now we're at where I talk a little bit about projections and coordinate systems, just to clarify a little bit at least what that's all about. Then we're getting toward uh, the end where I'll talk about some of the first things you would do in a GIS and then we're just about done. So um, let's go ahead and think about coordinate systems for a, a few seconds. Projections here. So um, I hope we're, we are in agreement that if we think about the shape of the Earth and what feature best describes that shape, I hope we would pick sphere instead of disk. Okay, so hopefully we all agree it's it's like a sphere. Then you think about the challenge of getting what's on that surface of the sphere, which is three dimensional. How do you get that onto a flat surface, a two dimensional thing like a map, a paper map, or like a computer screen. Um, that's kind of tricky. Like if you're picturing peeling an orange and making that into a totally flat rectangular thing, um, good luck, right? <laughs> it's not gonna work too well. So smart people over the centuries have come up with ways to figure out how to make that translation. And here are three of the more basic ones. Um, I think you get the idea. There's a light bulb shining in the middle of the earth and it's coming out through the surface onto some kind of feature that's wrapping around it. And then you cut it and there you have it. Um, so we have the cylindrical at the top. And I think we've all seen maps like this where Greenland is very, very, very large, right? Um, that would be a, a cylindrical projection. Uh, conical, 
is often used for, say, in like North America. That's when you see the boundary between the United States and Canada kind of curving rather than just a straight line across. And then um, the planar uh, is often used for the polar regions. So those are three ways that people have come up with translating that information. But I think if you think about it, you know, this won't be a big surprise. In a projection, something has to be distorted. distorted. You can't preserve all attributes or the qualities of a, something on a curved surface when you're smooshing it down onto a flat surface, whether it's shape or area or distance or direction, one or more of those things has to give. And of course, you would pick your projection based on what your purpose is. So if you are interested in making nautical charts for mariners who sail the seas, you would pretty much want to make sure you can preserve distance and direction as accurately as possible. Um, that's super important for, for them to get to where they need to go. But you might be able to sacrifice the shape or the area of something. So again, with those different projections, they come up with different looking maps. And this is an old but very um, good illustration of what the result is. None of these are wrong. Um, none of these three projections are wrong, but you get into trouble if you're smooshing them together and you're dealing with, say, the state of Maine. Um, we're in very different positions here, same with Florida and so forth. So what this means is when you are out there looking for data for a GIS and perhaps one set of data, which is awesome, comes from an entity that created it in one projection and you want to combine it with a map from another place that used a different projection, the GIS is going to have trouble with it in a sense. It's really good now at uh, what they call reprojecting on the fly. So in other words, making those the same uh, so that they line up well visually. But that is not such a great idea if you are ever going to um, like do an, an analysis. You really need something to be reprojected. So there'll be all kinds of questions that you have to figure out the answer to in order to proceed and get results that match up really on the on the Earth's surface. So going along with projections, there are coordinate systems. Um, there are hundreds of them. Many of them are based on the sphere. So when you think about latitude and longitude, that's expressed in terms of angles, right? So like 32 degrees north, 15 degrees west, something like that. That's describing angles. Projected coordinate systems are once we've already got what's on the Earth's surface flat. So anything, if you see like a UTM projection or coordinate system or state plane, something like that, that's a grid coordinate where it's just numbers on an X, Y, X axis and a Y axis kind of thing. Um, and going along with all of that, you still you have another element to think about, which is called a datum. It's a point on the Earth's surface that links the model that was used to create the projection to the actual Earth's surface. So this quote is like, even if you think you've got it solid because you've got maps in the same projection, if they used a different datum to create that map, um, the coordinates might not match up. So all of these things to think about, um, there's lots to explore there, but just to make you aware that these are some issues that could arise if you're bringing in data from different sources and they, the maps were created differently. Okay, so typical first steps in using a GIS. If you're just getting your feet wet and opening up something and trying it for the first time, what kind of things are you going to do? Well, one would be to choose a base map. This is what you see before you add any data. And you have lots of choices. Um, you can have imagery there. If, if you're doing urban kind of things, you might want something that emphasizes the streets as a base map. Um, there's a few choices that emphasize the landscape, you know, the relief, the topography. If that's more important for your application, lots and lots of choices in most of the GIS that are out there now. So, um, and you don't have to start with that. You can, you can just use whatever comes up as a default and then switch it later. No problem with that at all. 
but just to realize that you have lots of choices um, for what you've got in the background on your data. When you do add data in, it's important to know that for most GIS, the order of the layers in this panel, which is usually called like the layers list or the table of contents or something like that, the order affects what you can see. So for instance, on the left-hand side, I've got a layer that's the UCR campus boundary on the top. And I've got two other layers in there too, parking lots and destinations. I can't see much of the other two layers because the boundary is covering everything up. But when I move the boundary down to third place, now I can see the parking lots and the destinations on this map on the right. So just to be aware, that can really trip you up sometimes. It's like, I know I added this layer in, why can't I see it? It could be that it's because something else is covering it up because it's further up the list. When data gets loaded into a GIS, um, it's kind of a default thing as far as what color it is, if it's points, like what size the points are. And it may not be what you want. Um, you're not stuck with it is the good news. So these are, re, um, these are screenshots I took from QGIS to show you just a few of the choices you can make to change the symbology of points, lines, or polygons. So points can be different colors. You can change the size. You can have all kinds of interesting effects like a shadow, something like that with the points. Um, if you wanted a dashed line, you don't have to physically create a dashed line starting and stopping it. Um, they can symbolize it that way for you. And you have lots of choices as well with um, filling in areas or polygons. Like this is an outline. So for instance, for that campus map or the campus boundary, I might choose something like this um, where the inside of the boundary is, is clear and I can see what's under there and all I see is the outline of the, of the polygons. So you can also change, I don't know if you see up here, the opac opacity. So that means if you want it to be partially see-through, you, uh, you can adjust that as well. So lots and lots and lots of changes that you could make to the symbology. I need to mention selection tools. Um, selection is kind of, think of it as a filter. So when you, select features on the map. You can use your cursor to select features, or you can use what's called a query um, in a different uh, little tool where you're looking at, I want to see all the features that have this particular attribute or something like that. Um, what selection allows you to do is to edit the features that you have selected. So you can move them around. If it's something like a line or a polygon, you might be able to change its shape. Um, you can assess the features, the attributes of the selected features, and only the selected features if you have them selected. And like I said, you can uh, do that query and see of all the features that are on my map, which are the ones that have this particular attribute. Um, so that's very handy and you can do all kinds of analysis with those once you have them selected. Then um, if you want to, what you can do next is go ahead and start creating features or perform analysis. So on the left-hand side, this is just an, a screenshot of a polygon I created in Google Earth. Um, I can give it a name. I can change what it looks like. I can add links and things to it. Um, so that's one example for Google Earth. On the right, we have some tools that are available to you in ArcGIS online. Um, each of these down here could be opened up to show many more tools. So that just gives you an idea of some of the out of the box things that you can do. You don't have to know how to write code in order to perform the analysis. They have tools that are pretty much set up and all you do is supply the inputs and things and options and then the tool will do the rest of the work. Okay, we're almost done. I'm just going to give you the resources slide which uh, again, these are things, some of them have been suggested to me as good uh, jumping off places to learn more about GIS. Uh, some I just found online and they looked like they would be very promising. So uh, you're welcome to explore any of these. Of course, on YouTube, there's all kinds of videos as well. So um, yeah, this 
I hope this was a, a good introduction to the basics about GIS, but there's lots more that you can explore based on your own interest and uh, your own particular thoughts on how you could apply uh, some of these spatial analysis or display characteristics for what you've got going on or what you may have going on in the future. So with that, I'll just be quiet for a second and see if anybody has any questions or comments. And um, if that uh, link to the, the survey could be added to the chat, that would be awesome. There it is. Um, yeah, that would help help out a lot to know if this is hitting the mark or um, there's some other things that you would like to see done differently. Um, Okay, I'm not seeing any comments in the chat or hearing anything. So I will just advance to the next slide and thank you for your attention. Um, the library offers lots of workshops on all kinds of topics. So you would, would wanna check out our website and see what they are. Um, here's my contact information. If you have questions about what's available at UCR or how I, would go about doing a certain thing with the GIS, um, I'm available for those types of things. Okay, thank you for the comments. And again, um, if you registered, you will be getting a copy of the slides and hopefully that will help refresh something you can refer back to. Um, and yeah, please be in touch if there's anything I can do to help you. Okay, I do see a comment about the link for the ArcGIS online um, workshop coming up. Um, what I'll probably do is just share that in the chat in a couple of uh, seconds here. So let me go ahead and stop sharing, Let's see if I can find that link.